Let me extend to you a very, very special invitation. Tonight, that's right, tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a praise and worship service. Uh, we're going to take time to pray for people spiritually, physically, and then we're going to close with just a special communion service. So if you're not doing anything tonight at 6 o'clock, we want to encourage you to be back. We're going to have a wonderful time worshiping the Lord. Uh, we're going to be praying for people, and we're going to end the service by having communion with the Lord, and it's going to be great. Uh, so I want you to be back for that. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. And since we're kind of in football season, let me just talk a little bit about football. In 2017... The NFL, draft, the NFL draft was taking place. And the Chicago Bears were number two on the selection pick. And they had a choice. They could have chosen a young man by the name of Patrick Mahomes from Texas Tech. Kind of unpopular, but did a lot of neat things at Texas Tech. Or they could have chosen a guy by the name of Mitchell Trubisky from North Carolina that had set a lot of records. They weren't quite sure about Patrick Mahomes, a little bit of doubt. So they went with Mitchell Trubisky. Four years later, he is second string on the Chicago Bears. He is not even their first string starter. However, the one person they doubted is phenomenal. He has been selected to three Pro Bowls. He has won a Super Bowl. He has won a Super Bowl MVP. He has won an NFL MVP. He has been like named all whatever you want to call it in the NFL. And not only that, he has the highest paid contract of any NFL player ever. Do you think the Chicago Bears are kicking themselves because they had a doubt in their mind? And even though they watched him on film, they watched how he could play because they doubted him. They chose somebody else. And we all know the answer to that is yes. And so often you and I get to the place in our lives where we begin to doubt. And our doubt makes us stop. It freezes us. And because we stop and freeze, then we're a lot like the Chicago Bears. We're going to be kicking and regretting every step of life. And so this morning, I want to speak to you on the subject, if you say so. If you say so. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 says this. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge. For their fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping out into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, who's also called Peter, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we'd worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the boat. And soon both boats were so filled with fish on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I am such a sinful man. For he was so awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. Wow. Let me give you a little bit of a backdrop. So this is really Peter's first encounter with Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that Peter had not been walking with the Lord all this time. This was really Peter's first experience and first encounter with Jesus and obviously, we know through Scripture that when at the age of 12, when Jesus spoke in the synagogue, he spoke with power. That even the scribes and Pharisees were amazed. So we have to understand that when Jesus was teaching in this boat, he captivated and captured everybody's heart and mind. Even Peter. I mean, everybody knew there was something special 
about this man named Jesus. And when it was all said and done, Jesus then asked Peter, whose family were fishermen, their family were fishermen, that he'd grown up on the water all of his life to begin to do things that were very uncharacteristic of fishermen. After all, if you have fished all your life at this certain location, at this certain sea, you know when the fish bite, you know when they don't bite. You know when to go, you know when not to go. I mean, it's just obvious. If you've been there long enough and you're a skilled fisherman, you know what to do. But Jesus tells Peter that he wanted him to go out again. And I find this very interesting because even though he doubted, he went out. Even did, even that he doubted, he still set out. Now, I want you to hear this, church, because sometimes we miss some key things in the Bible. Listen to what Simon Peter says. Listen, we've worked all night long, and we haven't caught a thing. Now, listen, Jesus, I know you're a skilled preacher, but I've never seen you on the water. And, buddy, let me tell you, I've been here all my life. But even though you tell me to go, I'll go. Do you understand? There was doubt in his mind. Notice that the Bible doesn't say, praise God, let's go. You see the inflection. You hear the heart of Peter saying, if you say go, I'll go. Now, come on, we've all been there. Somebody's trying to tell you something. You say, okay, if you say that, let's go. Because really what you're doing is you say, I want to prove my point. We're going to go out there and nothing's going to happen. Then I can say, see, I told you. See, I, I fished all night long. And I didn't catch anything. But notice that even in his doubt, even when he doubted, that he still moved in faith and listened to the Lord. Even though he was doubting. So often God will tell you to do something. So often you'll hear the Lord cry to your very heart and you doubt. And rather than being like Peter and say, Lord, even though I doubt you, even though this doesn't make sense to me, God, I'm going to move out and try it. Usually we don't. Usually we say, Lord, that doesn't make any sense. God, I don't understand. I mean, after all, Jesus, I really don't even know you. And that's really what separates most of us. See, Peter really didn't know Jesus at that point. And because he really didn't know Christ at this point, he was questioning whether this was really valid, whether this is really going to work. And that's what's wrong with most of us today is because when you really don't know the heart of the Lord and you begin to doubt what he says because you won't trust him enough to follow him. But when you know Jesus and you really make him the Lord of your life, it doesn't matter what he tells you, you'll follow. But when you don't know him, you question him. Now, listen, I get it. It's human nature. We have had so much doubt placed in our mind. Sometimes we don't know whether to come or to go. We don't know whether to move forward or move backwards. But what I want to encourage you from this passage and understand that even though Peter doubted Jesus and even though Peter really did not know who Jesus really was, I mean, he recognized him as master, but that word master means to be leader. I mean, he recognized that Jesus was a leader because the way he was preaching, the way that he was teaching was just, it was just uncalled for. It was renowned. He said, Lord, even though I really don't know you, I will listen to what you say and I'll do what you tell me to do. If you and I will learn, now hear me when I say this, because this is going to be a little bit hard to believe. If you'll learn to quit thinking and start trusting, life will be different for you. If you'll learn to quit thinking and start trusting, life will be different for you. I play golf with a group of men, and, and we're not the best. I mean, we're not like Henry Jones. But on occasion, we'll have some good holes, and on occasion, we'll have bad holes. And usually when the holes get bad is because we start thinking too much. Rather than trusting our body, rather than trusting our swing, we try to start thinking things out. And every now and then, we'll tell each other, quit thinking, just swing. You know what? Sometimes it would be good for you and me to quit thinking and start trusting. Yeah. So Peter, even though he doubted, started moving forward. 
But not only that, Peter, he went deeper with the Lord. Look at verse 4, what it tells. He says, now go out where it is deeper. Now think about that. Here we go again. Skilled fishermen. Say that again. You want me to go deeper? Lord, we catch the fish around here. You want me to go deeper? You know why Jesus wanted Peter to go deeper? Because your life will never change in the shallow end of the shore. You always got to go deep. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. Yes, what? The deep things of God. The deep things. We get so caught up in asking Christ to fill us, to move us, to shake us, that we probably forget the most important thing in all. God, I want to I chase after you. And Lord, I want to get to know you so well that I'll know your heartbeat. I want to know the deep things about you. I have a famous quote that I like to tease around the office. I say, you know, deep down, I'm really shallow. (laughs) And if the truth were to be known, deep down, a lot of us are really shallow spiritually. Because see, all we ever ask God for is help me out with my finances. God, help me not to be late for work. Lord, please save my boss so they won't fuss at me anymore. And we do all these things on the surface. But we, when's the last time you said, Lord, today I'm going to sit down before you. And God, I want to know your heart. God, I want to know what you're thinking right now about me and about the world. Lord, I want to hear you. But that's not usually the way we do that. And the reason we don't do that is because it's a little beyond us to think that way. Let's be honest. The spiritual life, it can be mind-blowing sometimes. And I get that. After all, our little finite mind cannot understand the infinite God. But just because we cannot understand it, it shouldn't discourage us not to go after it. You realize that the, um, the formation of rain is one of the things that have baffled scientists for many, many years. The formation of rain. Think about that. So the sun beats down on the ocean and it heats the water up and the water then evaporates. It draws up into the atmosphere and when it gets high enough in the atmosphere, then it begins to cool down and condensates. And that condensation then forms droplets of water. And when those droplets of water form enough, then they rain back down on planet Earth. And that starts all over again. And you say, well, that's pretty easy to understand. What's the big deal about that? Do you know what the average cloud weighs? Take a guess. 1.1 million pounds. The average cloud. Some of us are a little below average. Some of us are above average. But the average cloud weighs over a million pounds. Now, how in the world does a million pound cloud stay up in the sky and not fall down? Mind blowing. Can you figure that out? I know I can't, but you know what? It's the same thing in our spiritual life. God wants to do so many wonderful things in your life that it's going to blow your mind. But the problem is you want to try to understand it and you can't. And the more you try to think about it, and the more you try to evaluate it and dissect it, the worse it gets. And what we need to understand is sometimes it's just best not to think, but to trust and follow him out to the deep. Because when we go to the deep, life really does change. And how do I know life changes in the deep? Because verse 6 tells us that. Because see, see Peter, he went from an empty net To an overflowing one. Lord we have fished all night long. Haven't caught a thing. But God I'm going to listen to you. God I'm going to go out in the deep. Although it makes no sense. Although it may be a little scary. And when he followed Jesus out into the deep. His net overflowed. The reason why we are so empty. The reason why we are so shallow. Is because we stand on the shoreline of faith. And never get deep. With the Lord. That's our problem. You wonder why your prayers are not answered. You wonder why your life is miserable. You wonder why you even question the existence of God. Is because you're still standing on the shoreline. I want you to hear this close and hear me clearly. Your life will never truly change. Being on the shore or the shallow end of the water. It only changes when you go deep. Hear me again. 
your life will never truly change. Being on the shore or being in the shallow end of the pool, it only changes when you go deep. How do I know that? There are numerous people in our world today that don't know how to swim. And that's sad. They've never learned to swim. You know why they've never learned to swim? Because they're too scared. They're too scared they're going to get out over in the deep and they're going to drown and they'll never make it back to the shore. And because they're so scared, they've never learned. So what they do is they sit on the shore or they wade in about knee deep and that's as far as they're going to go. Because they're too scared to go deep. And what has happened in their life is they have missed the most phenomenal things you could ever miss. Now, if you don't swim today, you're missing out. I took a group of youth a couple years ago to the Bahamas. The Bahamas are beautiful, but here's what happens. You have to do about a hundred yard swim that's over your head to get out to this reef. But when you get out to the reef, you can stand on the reef and it's like watching Finding Nemo all over again. Man, the fish are so colorful. They're so bright. They're so vivid. But the problem is you have to learn to swim out to the deep to see them. Now, let me tell you what's neat about this reef. Not only this reef was so eye-catching, but you could swim about another 20 feet from the reef, and then you met the cliff where it dropped down about 80 feet to 90 feet down. Just black. Here we are on the reef experiencing the beauty of the Lord. Swim out another 80, 90 feet, and then it just drops completely off the map. Some of you have sat on the shoreline all your life watching the rest of us swim in the sea of the Lord, experiencing His goodness, experiencing His pleasures, experiencing all the wonders that He has. And the reason you haven't is because you've never, ever gotten into the deep. That's, that's the easiest I can explain this. So let me give you another way, maybe. The Bible tells us in Psalms 34 to taste and see that the Lord is good. That sounds good, doesn't it? Taste. I mean, you ever gone like to the mall, you go to these places and they want to give you this sample of trying their food? You know why they do that, don't you? Because when you try it, what's the next thing they want you to do? They want you to buy it. I mean, I don't know about you, but now my weakness is chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream. If you give me a taste of chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream, I am in big trouble. I'm ready to eat the whole gallon. A taste of chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream just doesn't do me any good. I've got to have the whole thing. But a lot of us, see, we've only tasted and saw that the Lord is good. We haven't gone any further. We've just tasted. That's it. Now, I don't know about you. Just getting a taste of food just doesn't satisfy me. I want the whole thing. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4 says this. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened. Those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit. Who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of this age. They've only tasted. Listen, you will die physically if you only taste food. If the only thing you ever do in life is just taste food. And that food never gets down to here. You're going to die. You will die spiritually if you only tasted the Lord and you never allowed it to get down here to change your life. And see, we've come to church. We sing the praises. God has answered a prayer here or maybe God's answered a prayer there and you've tasted the Lord. And God said, I don't want to give you a taste. I want to inundate you with my love. I want to lavish you with my power. I want to lavish you with my knowledge and my wisdom to grow you and to strengthen you for this thing called life. But if all you've ever done is tasted, you've missed it. Peter had only tasted Jesus when he was on the shore. He heard the word and said, wow, man, this guy, Jesus, is incredible. But when Jesus took him out to the deep and Peter went and Peter followed him in faith, he experienced the fullness of the Lord so much that it broke the nets. That's how much you got a hold of the Lord. God doesn't want you just to taste him this morning. God wants you to experience him all the way down. But you doubt him and that's your problem. You doubt him and that's why you won't step out in faith. You doubt him and that's why you don't trust him. 
I understand it's hard to have faith. But even if you doubt him, please step out in obedience and follow him so that he can change your whole way of thinking in life. Church, it's, we've been here way too long just to taste. It's time that you experience Jesus and see the goodness that he can bring in your life. To see the prayers that he can answer. To see the change that he can bring. That's what we need. And until you experience him in his fullness, you never will. Some of you have only tasted, and that's why your life is a literal hell. Some of you have only tasted, and that's why you're mad. That's why you're just completely confused. Because you've been around the shore. You've gotten your feet wet, but you've never plunged in head first. When Peter finally went deep, his entire life changes. Why? Because Jesus went from being an amazing speaker to being a sovereign God. Jesus, in Peter's life, went from being an amazing speaker to being a sovereign Savior. Just that simple. He went that direction. And we see that in verses 5 and in verses 8. See, in verse 5, Peter calls him just master. Just, you're the leader. You're a gifted speaker. You're the master. But notice in verse 8, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he called him Lord. In just a brief moment of Peter's life, it went from recognizing Jesus as being this gifted communicator to being the Savior and the sovereign Lord of the earth. How did that happen? Because he listened to him. And even though he doubted him, he followed him. And then Jesus showed him the difference he could make in his life. If you never see Jesus as the sovereign creator of the world, if you never bow down to him as the king of kings and the Lord of lords, he'll only, only be to you just a gifted communicator, just some guy that you show up in church on Sunday to sing to and hear about, and then you go home and your life never changes. Do you remember the TV show that came out in the late 60s? It's called Gilligan's Island. Y'all remember Gilligan's Island? Some of you young folks don't even know what Gilligan's Island was. It was about... It was about these people that got in this little old boat called the SS Minnow. I never figured out why in the world would a millionaire be in this little ship. But, you know, it's a storyline. You leave it alone. And they go out and, of course, they get caught in a storm. And then they're basically marooned on a deserted island for 15 years. And over and over again, they try to get off, but they just can't. Why? Because they don't know how. Even though they have a professor with them. They try over and over and never get off. All because they allowed a skipper that had only been around the shoreline, never in the deep ocean on the big ships, and his helpmate that was, you know, Gilligan was just as goofy as they got, to lead them. Winds up on the island for 15 years and finally at the end they're saved. And if you know the storyline, and if you haven't, I'm sorry I'm going to ruin it. They get back on the boat and get marooned once again all over on the island. I mean, you talk about dumb. I mean, didn't you just go down this path 15 years ago and you're going to do it again? I mean, trust me, if I had been deserted on an island for 15 years, there's no way on this earth I'd ever step foot on a boat again. I'd have just stuck on shore. But here's, here's what I'm trying to te teach you. We get so caught up in following the wrong people that they maroon us on a deserted island. They leave us heartbroken. They leave us helpless. They leave us deserted. And the more we try to listen to them to get off of it, the worse it gets. And some of you have been caught so deserted for so long, you've given up. You've given up. Because you only see Jesus as a gifted speaker. You do not see him as a sovereign savior. Listen, I am caught in my alcoholism and I never can get out. Wrong. You are caught and you'll never get out as long as you believe that. You've got to learn to quit doubting the Savior, step out and trust Him. I am caught in this so-called mixed up life. Listen, you're only caught there because you won't let Him get deep in your life and save you and change you. The only reason you are where you are today is because number one, You've caused yourself to be there and you won't let Jesus get out. Or number two, you've accepted him as Lord and Savior and he's leading you on the wildest ride of your life. Just that simple. Where are you at this morning? 
Are you caught on this deserted island? You're full of misery. You're full of regrets. You're full of I can't. I cannot. Are you going to follow Jesus in faith and say, Lord, it's time for me to get off this island. It's time for me to get back to the mainland so that I can experience the joys of life. So that I can enjoy loving you and living for you and enjoying these things you've made for me. It's just that way. You have to make that decision. Are you still on the shore of the deserted island? Are you just weighing your feet in? Or you say, Lord, I'm tired. I don't know where you're going to take me, but I'm wandering out in the deep this morning. I'm going to get there. Trust me. When you get into the deep, your life will drastically change. How do I know that? Because verse 9 tells us, Peter was awestruck. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught. Listen, when you truly go out into the deep after the Lord, he will leave you in such awestruck you'll never go back. You will never go back. I am so thankful that he has changed my life. And I'm so thankful after 45 years of walking with Jesus, I am still to this day in awe struck of what he does in my life. Has it always been easy? By no means. But let me tell you what. When life gets tough. I don't worry. All I have to do is trust. And he'll take me. And he'll lead me. Doesn't mean he'll deliver me from the storm. It just means he'll deliver me through the storm. And that's okay with me. Because I know. Who holds me in the palm of his hands. I know who has created me to live for him and to love him and to enjoy him. And that's why life is good. What made the difference in Peter's life can make the difference in your life. I promise you. Peter, listen to the Lord. And I'm asking you this morning, are you listening to the Lord? Even though Peter doubted Jesus, he still acted on his word. And this morning, you may not think that God can deliver you from the situations and the mess you're in. But if you'll have enough to face, say, Lord, I, don't figure, I haven't figured this out. And God, I'm not sure how you're going to do this, but I'm going to step out on faith this morning. and I'm going to trust you. Peter stepped out on faith and said, Lord, even I don't understand. I'm, I'm going to go what you're going to do. And then he went into the deep. He went into a place he'd probably really never been fishing. And God wants to take you and me to a place that we've never really been spiritually. But we've got to trust him. And we've got to go deep. Because your life will never ever change. Unless you get deep with Jesus. And when you get deep with Jesus. You're going to realize just how powerful. Just how marvelous he is. Listen. Read the Bible. If he can raise a dead man to life, he can heal you. If he can make the sun stand still for 24 hours, he'll move heaven and earth for you. But you got to trust him. In your doubt, trust him and go deep. And let me tell you what, when you go deep, here's what's going to happen when you leave today. You will be left in awe. Because he'll fill you, he'll overflow you, he'll deliver you, and he'll change you. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that your words have been heard. I pray this morning for every person who is in doubt of you today will step out in faith for the first time in their life and trust you. To be the sovereign Lord that you are. And I pray Lord as they walk out in faith. And they begin to trust you. That Lord you'll immediately begin to release them. You'll begin to just cleanse them. And heal them and forgive them. So as they approach this altar Lord. Their lives will be changed. Father today. Please. Leave us in awe. Please. Help our unbelief to believe. So that, Lord, truly, we can move forward in life and we can experience the deep things of you. 
And I pray that in your son's name, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.